What's up everyone? Brandon here from Gears. If you guys watch any of our Gears dailies at all, then you know that I love to go running, hiking, and whatever else I can with my dog, Sadie. To be fair, we do have another dog named Bubba, but he's a little 14 pound Yorkie poo, so doesn't really make a lot of those kind of extreme adventures. Along the way, we've gotten quite a few questions about running or taking your dog along on adventures like that. And so what I thought we'd do today is address some of those in an Ask Gears segment. So here are our tips about how to get started Started running with your dog. Now if you're starting out getting a brand new dog, puppy, rescue dog, whatever, you want to make sure that the breed you're getting, if you're getting that dog to make sure it can run with you, is appropriate. Not only is that based on certain physical characteristics of the breed, but also temperament. And finally, what climate you live in. Is it pretty hot? Is it pretty cold? Does it have four general seasons? And when are you going to be taking your dog running in those seasons? Down in the description of this video, we've placed a link to an image that actually comes from a book that gives you a nice layout, a chart of sorts to tell you what dogs, what breed of dogs, are more appropriate for what types of running. Something else to consider for running breeds is that generally speaking, dogs with more squished faces, shortened noses, aren't going to be super great for running. And the reason is because there are abnormalities in their airway, which make them more susceptible to things like heat stroke because they can't really process that air and cool their bodies down effectively. But, so you don't have to click out to that, we're gonna go down a really quick list of some of the best running dogs that we know of. First is the Australian cattle dog and its close relative, the Australian Shepherd. Next, Labrador Retriever. Next, Brittany Spaniel. Next, a German short-haired pointer and now an English setter. The little guy in the crowd is the Jack Russell Terrier. Next up is the Vishla. Then everyone's favorite firehouse dog, the Dalmatian. Right near the top of all running dogs list is the Weimaraner. Then there's the big and uniquely striped Rhodesian Ridgeback. And finally, and yeah, we're a little bit biased on this one, is the Border Collie. And this is me with Sadie on a run. So now that you've got your dog, what do you do? Well, you want to make sure that your dog is old enough. A dog's skeletal system doesn't reach full maturity until at the earliest about eight months, and some dogs can take up to 20 months. That brings us to our next point, which is to make sure you talk to your veterinarian. You want to do this to not only make sure that your dog is the right age for their breed to begin running with you, but you also want to make sure that your dog's overall health is right for running. The last thing you want to do is take out your dog if it has some sort of congenital thing like hip dysplasia or something like that on a long run, which could really exacerbate their condition and end up really injuring your animal. The next thing is that you want to treat your dog no differently than you would treat yourself or somebody that you are advising on when they're starting running, and that is to build up slowly. Why don't you try starting with about a mile every other day or so, give or take, and during that time, you really want to make sure that your dog is recovering properly. As you begin to build up little by little, following a generally 10 to 15% rule, you're going to notice that your dog is going to, during breaks, be able to stop and stop that intense panting so quickly. So it'll, they'll be panting really intensely after running and then it'll settle back quickly. That's a good indication that your dog's resting heart rate is becoming more and more stabilized and that they're able to recover more quickly from running. Now, of course, that buildup is going to take a different amount of time for different people depending on how far you ultimately want to run. And keep in mind that it's not always about distance. It's not always about how far you want to run, but more often than not, how long you're going to run in terms of time. Also during this buildup, keep an eye on your dog's pads and make sure that those things are really holding up well. We're gonna talk about this more in another point in a second. The next thing is that you want to be in control while on your run. Now just as you would when you're walking down the street with your dog on a leash, you wanna make sure that you've got your dog well in control. The reasons for this are numerous depending on where you live. One, obviously you don't want your dog to jump on other people or to get into it with other canines, but more more importantly, you don't want them getting away from you and running into traffic or something like that. Now, while I have been known to carry a retractable leash on some trail runs where I know there aren't going to be many people, mainly because I don't need to use the leash on those trail runs all the time, when I'm going on any run that's anywhere near traffic where there are other people or other canines, I like to carry a six foot fixed length leash. This way it's easier to control. With a retractable leash, especially if they've got that running room, a dog can really build up a head of steam, can get some speed going, and can jerk that leash out of your hand 
hand and also possibly injure their neck. The next point is what type of thing do you attach that leash to your dog's body with? Now, some of us use a collar. I find that with my dog Sadie, I don't really need to use more than a collar much of the time because she listens and comes. However, if you find that your dog needs a little bit more control, you want to have your dog so it can't wiggle out of a collar or something like that, or you just want to protect your dog's neck a little more, a full body harness is a really great option where the buckle, the shackle, is going to be right in the middle of the shoulders there. So you're going to have a lot more control over that dog. And if you have to pull or if it pulls against you, it's not going to risk injuring the dog's neck quite as much. The next thing is actually really, really important. And it is something that I, as somebody who runs a lot of trails, have had to keep an eye on with Sadie. And that is to make sure that your dog's pads are intact. Now the pads, just like our feet, you have to consider are the thing that are going to come in contact with the ground. And while we have shoes, our dogs don't most of the time. The first thing to consider is temperature. If it's too hot out for you to place your palm flat on the hot concrete or pavement or what have you, then it's probably too hot for your dog's foot. In that case, it might be a good idea to find a path or something like that where the temperature is going to be a little more distributed. Before and after each run, you want to make sure that you thoroughly inspect your dog's pads. You can easily do this, just get them to lay down on their back or something like that. Take each paw, spread the toes gently, and inspect in between each of the pads, in between each toe. Make sure there are no cuts that you may not have noticed before. Nothing like a foxtail, which is a little type of burr seed pod thing that may get stuck down in there. The reason for this is that if there is a cut, just like you might get an infection, your dog might get an infection. So really make sure their pads, again, the only only thing that is between the rest of their bodies and the grounds are nice and intact. The final point that I'll bring up is that if a run is long enough for you to need some water, it is definitely long enough for your dog to need some water. What I like to do on a longer run is that I'll bring a collapsible nylon bowl that's very easy for me to take my hydration pack and put water directly into that bowl for my pack. But why not let them drink directly from the stream? Well, the same as you won't drink directly from a stream because of parasites like Giardia and the like because you don't want to poop your pants on the way down, your dog can be susceptible to those things as well. So consider that. In a pinch, I've also definitely found divots and rocks and things like that to kind of act as a natural bowl. But the bigger point is to make sure that your dog, especially in hot weather, is remaining hydrated. So those are our tips for getting you outside and running with your dog. And we want to hear your tips. If you've got anything that we mentioned, please let us know down in the comments section below. If you want to see more videos like this or any of our regular reviews, please don't forget to subscribe to our channel and also give this video right here a like and a favorite. We would greatly appreciate it. If you've got any questions, for us or want to hear a question of yours on our Ask Gearist segment, don't hesitate to either email info at gearist.com or leave a comment down in the comment section below. As always, follow us on all of our social media outlets, which you can see right here. And don't forget, once again, to subscribe to this YouTube channel by clicking that YouTube button right over there. Thank you guys so much, and we will see you next time.